So 1 Timothy chapter 4, of course, we're going uh, chapter uh, by chapter through the book. And uh, this chapter has got a, a few different things it's about, but uh, kind of just covers the reality uh, or, uh, and, uh, and the nature uh, of, uh, <coughs> uh, of those that, uh, the nature and doctrine of those that depart from the faith. That's where it kind of starts out of. And then it kind of works into, you know, what makes a good minister and, you know, priority, uh, pri uh, giving priority to the physical versus the, or to the spiritual, rather, excuse me, than the physical. And then the motivating, uh, if you've noticed, again, it seems like in every chapter there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a theme throughout this book or a motivating purpose is really what it is. The purpose, the, the motivation behind what's being written is repeated again in this chapter, just as it was in the previous chapters. And of course, you know, where it, where it says, you know, for he is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Okay, and we'll get to that. And then, of course, at the end, it has that command to be an example to, of the believers and the practical manner as how to go about doing that. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. Now, it starts out there in, in verse 1 where it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, I want to draw our attention to that word expressly. You know, the, 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 the Bible quotes the Spirit in other places where it says, You know, the Spirit speaketh unto the churches. But it always doesn't use that word expressly. And I believe there's, there's a real purpose behind the, why it's using that word expressly. It's using that word expressly, and it should cause us to pay attention to what is being said. That's why it's using that word. Because the word expressly, it means the, it, the, the Spirit is speaking clearly. The Spirit is speaking directly. It's speaking explicitly. It's speaking very plainly. It's speaking very distinctly. You know, he wants to be understood. And he wants people to grasp what he's about to say. He's saying, the Spirit speaketh expressly. You know, whenever we read something like that where God's putting extra emphasis on what's being said, we should perk up and take note of that and, and, and take the time to work our way through what's being said. Now, keep yourself, uh, keep something there in 1 Timothy 4 and turn over to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. We'll look at some other verses in the Bible where this is used, this term expressly is used. And not only that, but where we can see other examples where people speak in a very expressive manner or in a way that would be similar to what is being shown here in 1 Timothy. You're going to Nehemiah 8. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 20, And behold, I will send a lad. Of course, this is when David is, is contemplating whether he should flee from the hand of Saul. And Jonathan, his son, comes out and shoots the arrow. And, he's, and he says, if, you say, if I say this, then you're going to go. And if I say this, then you can stay. And he says, And behold, I will send a lad, saying, Go find the arrow. If I s expressly say unto the lad, Behold, the arrows are on this side of these. Hey, if you hear me say this specific thing, very clearly, very distinctly, he wanted uh, David to understand exactly what was being said and what that meant. Ezekiel chapter 1, the Bible reads, The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of Chaldeans by the river Kibar. So, when it, of course, if we know the book of Ezekiel, you know, God speaks very expressly. He gives very, you know, some very fine details concerning the length of, of the temple and, and other things like that. He's, he speaks very expressively to Ezekiel. Now, here in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, you won't see the word expressly, but I believe we example, see an example of somebody speaking in a very express manner. Nehemiah chapter 8, the Bible says in verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he'd opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen and Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also a Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. So they were causing them to understand it. And how did they do that? The people stood in their place, so they read in the book, uh, they read in the book in the law of God distinctly. Right? That's another word that we could get synonymous with expressly, very expressively, very distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. They read the book expressly because they read it distinctly so that those listening would understand what is being said. So that's, and really, you know, before we even get, you can go back to 1 Timothy before we get into it. That's a good, uh, that's a good principle to apply to our preaching and our teaching, whether it be behind a pulpit, whether it be on somebody's doorstep or one-on-one -on -one speak, speaking the word of God to somebody. We should speak very expressly. We should speak very distinctly. We should be very clear in what we're saying, not so that, uh, so that the people that we're speaking to can understand what's being said. So they can understand what it is we're trying to get across. So the Spirit here in 1 Timothy is speaking plainly. It's speaking directly. It's speaking distinctly. It's being unambiguous. 
You know, it, it's telling us what will happen in the latter times. It's being very clear about it. Actually, if you would, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. So God is emphasizing here something when he speaks the press. What is it he's emphasizing in 1 Timothy? The reality of false prophets. That's what he's getting across, right? He's saying, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what he wants us to understand, that in the latter times, people are going to depart from the faith and they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and they're going to teach uh, demonic doctrine. You're there in 2 Peter, but I'll read to you. I mean, this is something that, that God has to draw attention to repeatedly in the scripture. And he wants us to understand this. That's why he's speaking expressly. And this is something that we see repeated throughout scripture. In, in, in Matthew 7, Jesus said, beware false prophets. He said, beware. You know, it, what does that mean to beware? You see the sign when you walk through the fence, beware of dog. It means you should be looking out for a dog. You need to be careful that there's a dog that might attack you. And he's saying here, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. First John chapter 2 says, Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are, are there many Antichrists. He's saying even now, in John's day, there are many Antichrists gone out into the world. You're there in 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 1. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. He's warning them. We're being warned over and over in Scripture of the reality of false prophets, of people that will come in and creep into churches who will privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. So verse, verse 1 tells us that we should be, you know, pay extra special attention to what's being said here. And we should uh, you know, take note of the fact of the warning that we've been given that there are going to be false prophets that come in, people that give heed to seducing spirits and teach doctrines of devils. <clears throat> they're teaching doctrines that oppose the teaching of Christ. They're teaching doctrines uh, in, in order to bring harm upon the body of Christ. They're preaching damnable heresies. They want to draw away disciples after them. They want, to, uh, they want to do damage to God's people. That's the purpose in what they're doing. So verse 2 and 3, you know, they kind of, we, we can move through this, this chapter. It says that kind of, uh, uh, verses 2 and 3, they, they apply broadly to many false religions. You know, and he says, look, there's going to be people that come and, and teach, uh, uh, you know, these wicked doctrines, th these, these seducing spirits, these doctrines of devils. And then he kind of gets into what the doctrines are, that they're going to be, what it is exactly they're going to be preaching. And when we look at this, you know, we're going to see that this applies today and we can identify groups of people that preach even today these same doctrines that he was warning us of all the way back then. So verses 2 and 3, I mean, of course, we could apply these to many false religions. You could probably apply these to a lot of different religions. But the Catholic Church is no exception to that. In fact, that when I read this, that's one that usually comes to mind. And we'll see a lot of the, 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 the doctrine that the Catholic Church teaches uh, we're being warned of here. It says, first of all, speaking lies and hypocrisy, verse 2, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to receive with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So there's several things there that bring to mind to me. And again, we could apply this to a lot of other you know, false religions. But to me, I always think of the Catholic Church here. It says they will be speaking lies. And these are the things that we're being warned about. He's saying, look, they're going to bring, they're going to be bringing in, uh, you know, doctrines of devils. They're going to be heavy to seducing spirits. These are the things that they're going to begin to teach. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. So we can, if we hear, if we hear or see prophets or people or religion preaching or practicing these things, we can say that's a doctrine of the devil. These are people that are seduced, have a seducing spirit that have gone astray. They've departed from the faith. One of the things they're doing is they're speaking lies, speaking lies, right? That's, you know, well, how would you apply that to, the, to a, a, a false religion like the Catholic Church, say? Well, do they not preach a false means of salvation? Yeah. You have to receive the sacraments. You got to do the works. You got to keep the commandments. I mean, of course, that, that umbrella of speaking lies in regards to salvation could apply to many different religions. It says there they're speaking lies in hypocrisy. So there's hypocrisy involved here as well. Now that has multiple applications where you could, we could apply the hypocrisy that we see. One, one thing we could see within the Catholic Church would be practicing idolatry, right? They have all the idols. They surround themselves with the statues and the images. When God told them not to make an image of anything that is in heaven or in the earth, not to bow down to them, they do that. They're surrounding themselves with this idolatry 
And they're claiming to praise and worship a God who forbids that idolatry. That's hypocrisy. They're speaking lies in hypocrisy. You know, what about uh, the, the fact that they preach this moral purity? You know, this physical purity, but the, their priests are involved in some of the most base, abominable, wicked, disgusting sins there are. And not just them. You know, this, this happens even in, 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 any, in any denomination or so-called Christianity you want to look at. Of course, the Catholic Church, you know, was, it was scandalous because it was so widespread and rampant and covered up and gone on for centuries. And it was, you know, broke and, and even to this day still continues. And they just got into the practice of moving people around. And now even in Baptist churches, this is taking place. Where they're, they're moving, they, they, these, these sexual predators get behind a pulpit and they start to prey on the people in, the, in the, uh, the pew. And the next thing you know, they get busted. And instead of outing them, and instead of calling them out and turning them over to the local authorities, they just move them over to the other side of the country. And say, well, you can just go on staff over here. And they just become repeat offenders. So, of course, that is hypocrisy to get up and to preach the moral purity, to say that, you know, you should keep yourself pure and all that, and then, and, and then in your off time, you know, you're involved in whatever sin. And these guys were obviously were involved in some very wicked sins when we talk about the Catholic Church. And I was even in the study of the, studying the Jehovah Witnesses. They have a huge scandal on their hand. They, that stuff's been going on there for a long time. I mean, you, and why do you say, why does that happen in, in, in religious settings? Because we're called, we're, we are what's called a soft target. We are by, by our, the, you know, the Bible commands us to be very loving and forgiving and, and, and patient people. So that kind of makes us a soft target. You know, but on the, other time, on the other hand, the Bible also tells us to be very vigilant. You know, and, to, and, and, and to beware of false prophets. And to, and to walk circumspectly. And that we are to you know, test all things and prove all things and cleave to that which is good and hold to that which is good. So, but, uh, you know, the other side of that coin is, is that we are to be very patient, very kind and all that. And, and, and predators, they take advantage of that. People who just want to do damage to the body of Christ or go in and satisfy some ungodly lust, they just see us as an opportunity to go in and practice that. Because a lot of churches, quite frankly, are a little too, are a little too permissive in who they let do whatever in their church. Uh, and, and, they, and they've got a practice of that. And it's just known among these people that would want to take advantage of that. So we see uh, you know, them you know, preaching this lies and hypocrisy when it comes to this, this sin. And, uh, and that would kind of tie in with them having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I mean, for a person to, to stoop so low as to go and do irreparable damage unto a child and their psyche and, and go after what the Bible would call strange flesh. No, no adult, no man, no woman naturally desires uh, a child in that way. It's unnatural. That's because they're reprobate. Any person is a pedophile, mark it down, has their conscience seared with a hot iron. They cannot be repaired. It's seared. That's scarred. I mean, go, you know, if you ever had any kind of a burn, if you get a severe enough burn, it's not, I mean, it's scars, but it's always there. The evidence of that burn will always remain. It's the same way with these pedophiles and these sodomites that are reprobate and given over to these things. They're seared with the hot iron. There's no repairing it. You can't repair their mind. You can't rehabilitate them. You know, putting them on a watch list, putting them on a background check, that's not going to fix them. The only thing that will fix them is an underground check, yeah. about six feet under. That's, right. that's the only way you're going to protect future victims from these people Amen. is by carrying out a, uh, the biblical justice, which is the death penalty, execution by a government, by the, the proper authorities, of course. So it says, you know, that kind of ties in together. They have their conscience seared with a hot iron, right? So we can kind of see this is a picture. You know, of course, again, we could apply it to many different false denominations, but boy, is it not a picture of the Catholic Church that we see here. And it gets even more detailed here. And, and that picture becomes more clear, too, as we go on. It says also that they are forbidding to marry. Now, does that not sound like the Catholic, like any... How, I mean, there's a lot of denominations. Oh, you can't get married. Then that's, that's a very strange and, uh, and quite frankly demonic doctrine to tell a grown man that he cannot uh, you know, enjoy the relationship that's found within marriage. And then you wonder why they turn out to be these freaks. I mean, you're, you're every, that's just a natural, uh, you know, God-given desire that a man has. And when you start to quench that and, 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 and to try to contain that unnaturally, by putting them in a, in a monastery somewhere with a bunch of other dudes, 
mark it down, weird stuff's going to happen, and you're going to produce a lot of freaks. So <laughs> that's one other thing. Note there, forbidding to marry. So you can't get married. Uh, how about this? Commanding to abstain from meats. You know, that's how you, where you get your local Friday fish fry, which is probably the only good thing to come out of the Catholic Church, in my opinion. The, you know, if you're in a Catholic, like back where I'm from in northern Michigan, very Catholic, everyone had, you know, uh, all-you-can-eat fish fry on Friday, and I could go belly up and, and just get myself some perch just nonstop. You know, so praise God for that. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's another correlation that we see with the Catholic Church. You know, the Lent. What are you going to abstain from? Well, I'm not going to eat any meat. You know, every Friday, no meat. You know, they, 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 these are the things they practice. No, no marrying, no meat. I mean, that doesn't sound like a very good religion, you know. <laughs> <coughs> and then they go on. You know, they, this would also tie in not only with the Catholic Church and the Buddhists and everybody else that abstains from these type of things, but you know, the, in the regards to marriage. But what about the rise of veganism and vegetarianism? That's demonic. You know, now I'm not saying that every single person that's a vegan or is a vegetarian is possessed with the devil. <laughs> but I'm saying they're being influenced by a demonic doctrine. And it says it's the doctrine of devils. That's what's being described here. You know, commanding to abstain from meats. It's a, it's a demonic doctrine. Amen? You know, if they can't get any man on that, I don't know, you guys, I don't know what's going on out there, but, but it is. And, and by the way, it's a growing movement. I mean, this vegetarianism, this veganism, you know, it's, it's, I didn't want to go on and on about it, but I looked at it briefly. I mean, it's on the rise. There's more and more people that are, that are going to this worldwide, you know, plant-based diets and things like that. But the Bible says that, you know, uh, they're commanding to abstain from meats which are to be received of them which believe and know the truth. Because a lot of times, what I believe you can also apply this to is the Judaizers. You know, this is kind of what he's referring to. Paul, I think, more specifically is the fact that you would have, have people that would say, hey, you still have to observe the Levitical diet. And we understand that the dietary restrictions that were given it for the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament uh, are done away in Christ. If you would, go ahead and turn over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And this is important to understand in this day and age. When, you're, when your relative you know, wants to come over and have a tofu burger, you know, and you say, no, it's meat in this house, or you know, you're going to have some Hebrew roots guy come around and say, you know, you can't enjoy a lobster. You know, well, I happen to like sea rat. You know, that's what I call them. The rat of the ocean, the lobster. It's delicious, right? Or if you want to have some sea roaches, that's shrimp, right? <laughs> yeah, they look good after they're prepared, but man, you saw them in wild. You're like, you're going to eat that? You're like, yeah, <laughs> delicious. But, you know, we should know these things. These are scriptures that, you know, as Baptists, we should be concerned about. Look there in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, uh, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, and was contrary, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, uh, openly triumphing over them in it, let no man therefore judge you in meat. Now that's the first thing he says. What is it that we're not going to be judged in? In meat, what we eat, what we put in our mouth. Or in drink, or of an holy day, or of a new moon, or of Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So, you know, that's fine if you want to be the one, you know, you know, eat herbs. You know, one that, uh, one eateth, that is weak eateth herbs, right? As it says. Or you know, if you want to be the vegetarian, and you want to be the vegan, that's fine. But don't try and impose that on me, right? right? We're going to have issues, <laughs> right? And really, you know, I'm kind of saying in a jokingly manner, but what does it say about that, about these dietary restrictions? That they were, uh, they, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. I mean, you want to take something off the cross and say, oh, no, you have to observe this? Well, he's the one that died for that, so that I wouldn't have to observe that. So don't take something that God's nailed to the cross, don't take it back off the cross and say, oh, no, it's still in play. Oh, this is still something we have to observe. No, friend, it's nailed to the cross. I'm going to leave it there. And I'm not going to mess with, uh, you know, if that's where God wants it, that's where it's going to stay. And, you know, even if something, you say, well, this is kind of a silly thing. I mean, who cares what we're eating? Well, some people, they, they go to extremes with this. You know, I'm not going to eat anything that has a face. You know, people won't even eat fish. You know, just because you can't hear them scream doesn't mean it's not murder. That's, that's, that's a statement that's made by these people. They get carried away with it. You know, and uh, well, we're going to go down and we're going to, I'm going to find a steak wrapped in bacon and topped with shrimp. I'm going to have a side of lobster with it. 
And because it's all nailed to the cross. These things have been taken away. Don't let somebody Judaize us and don't let some church come in and tell you that you have to abstain from meats. It's a demonic doctrine. So uh, he goes on there in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Why? Why is it that we can eat these things? For every creature of God is good. Some are even better than others, in my opinion. And nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. He goes on in verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. So these are things that we have to be told from time to time. These are things that we have to bring to remember, our remembrance again. That the things that have been nailed to the cross. The things that we are... Are, are the liberties that we have in Christ and not to be brought under the, uh, the power of any, not to be brought back again into bondage. <clears throat> if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So I want to kind of shift gears here because now he's kind of starting to talk about if you do, you remind him of these things, right? And what are these things? Of course, the fact that in the latter times some are going to depart from the faith teaching, uh, you know, uh, uh, seducing spirits, teaching doctrines of devils, and that they're going to teach, you know, to, for, uh, to abstain from marriage, forbidding to eat, having, uh, you know, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Remind the brethren of these things. And if you do that, you're going to be a good minister. And he kind of talks about, talks about what makes a good minister here. And what makes a good minister? What are the traits of a good minister of Jesus Christ? And on this, could, we can apply this to any of us. It says there, that he is uh, that he puts the brethren in remembrance, you know. And I know I've kind of already touched on this, but and if you would turn over to Second Timothy chapter three, but that putting people in remembrance of the same things that makes you a good minister of Jesus Christ. And we should never get to the place in our spiritual life where we say, "Oh, I've already heard this; it doesn't apply to me. I, I already know that; I don't need to hear it." Why is he talking about that again? Why does the preacher got to get up and preach on that again? Because that's what makes him a good minister Amen. to him put you in remembrance. Because, you know, we, 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 have to, we have to be mindful of these things. Less than any time, we should let them slip. Right. These things slip. We forget these things. You know, and we have to always be put in remembrance. We talked about the Lord's Supper and why we observe that. To, to remember the crucifixion of Christ. I mean, you think that's something, you would think, well, that's not something I'm ever going to forget. Well, maybe, maybe you're not going to forget, but maybe you're going to maybe take a little bit for granted. You're going to forget exactly what it is that Christ, we can, we can become dull of hearing. We can begin to forget some of these things. And a good minister is going to take the time to preach this book, and this book is repetitive. It, it preaches the same things over and over and over and drills it in. And, and, telling, and telling us here that a good minister, that's exactly what he does. He puts us in remembrance of those things. The Bible says, you're in 2 Timothy, I'll read you from 2 Peter. It says, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them. And be established in the present truth. He said, look, I already know you know these things. I know you're already established in the present truth. But I am not going to be negligent. And I'm going to put you always in remembrance of these things. He's going to keep doing it. He's going to keep bringing it up. And that's why Peter was a good minister of Jesus Christ. Because he did not neglect putting the brethren in remembrance of these things. Not just of these things that are specifically mentioned. But of all scripture. All the things that are in this book. All doctrine is profitable uh, for correction, for instruction. That, uh, you know, for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. These are the things that we have to constantly be putting in remembrance and, and always reminding ourselves of. It says that he puts the brethren in remembrance. Not only that, but he is also, he is nourished up. Now, you know, that, that's the opposite of somebody who's very famished. You know, so, you know we're talking spiritually, of course. It's, it, it, it's going to be somebody who's nourished up in the words of, uh, you know, of faith and of good doctrine. That's what's going to make us a good minister of Jesus Christ. If we have... The words of faith in our heart. You know, we're, we're, we're nourished up on the Word of God. We're in it. We're saturated by it. You know, we've been feasting on it. We, we're full with the Word of God. You know, we let the, the Word of Christ dwell uh, richly in us with all wisdom as we're instructed. And be, when we do that, then we can nourish others as well. So we're to be nourished up in the, 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 the words of faith and of good doctrine, right? And we should, we should be desiring good doctrine, being able to teach good doctrine. A good minister, you know, it's interesting that he uses that word, nourished up. Because nourished up, that's something that we would do to like a baby or a child. We would nourish our children. You know, we would, we would bring them up in the nourishment and admonition of the Lord, right? So it's kind of that context. And what I believe that's showing us is that a good minister of Jesus Christ is somebody who himself has been nourished up in the faith as well. 
He's somebody that's been nourished on the milk and the meat of the Word of God. Meaning this, that he was somebody who, who, who came up in the faith. It wasn't just uh, you know, somebody who just came on the scene and you know, just had it all put together. He was somebody that had to grow within the church. I mean, and Timothy is a great example of this. Uh, of, because when Paul came, Paul came and found him, he had a good report of the brethren. So he's a guy that was already in the church, already doing the work, somebody that was already growing in the Lord. And if you're there in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, look at verse 15, it, Paul says of Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. So even from a child, so Timothy is one who was nourished up in the faith. He was somebody that was taught the word of God, and he came up. And that's what a, good, a lot of good ministers do. They don't just start out as leaders. They start out as followers. They start out as somebody who has to grow in the faith. And that's where every good leader is going to start. You know, any, any, any pastor is going to start out in the pew. You know, and, and, and that's where it's really where, you know, you need to cut your teeth in, in the things of God is in the pew. You know, any, any good pastor is going to be the one that's out doing the soul winning, doing the work, getting in the trenches with somebody before he's a pastor. You know, you don't, you're not, you're not going to take, you're not going to, you're not going to do the works of God as a pastor if you're not doing them as a layman. You have to be nourished up in these things. You have to come up in it. So, and he goes on and says there, whereunto thou hast attained. <laughs> he says, you, you, you shall be nourished up in the words of faith and of God, good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So it's something that is attained. It is something that is worked towards. And, it, you know, Timothy had it. He has attained it because he was brought up. He was nourished. He was with Paul. He was, with his pro he was the protege of Paul. He served Paul. He was Paul's minister. When Paul said, go here, that's where he went. When he said, preach this, that's what he preached. He did what he was told. He was a follower of Paul. And he had attained under this position. So what that shows us is that it takes time to become a minister. And that, that you know, specifically Timothy here, of course, is being, you know, he's speaking in the context of being a pastor. And, you know, anyone who desires to be a pastor has to understand something. It takes time. It's not something that's just going to be overnight. You know, I talked a little bit about this already Sunday night, but you, you can't just, you can, you should always try to, you, of course, you have to meet the requirements, but it's beyond that. You know, it, it's more than that. It's, it's time in there. That, you know, there, there's things that you have to attain unto. It's not something that's just going to happen overnight. And, you know, we should be wary of anybody that is too eager for that position. You know, and somebody who just, it's, they have to be the pastor. They have to be the preacher. They have to be the person in charge or they just can't serve God. You know, that's the last guy you want as the pastor. Right. You, you know, the <laughs> I can't remember who I heard say this recently, but uh, somebody, I can't remember if it was in a sermon or where, but I heard a pastor saying that typically what you would, what, what you see with, with great men of God in the Bible is that they have to be talked into doing it. You know, they're not just volunteering. I mean, look at Moses. He had to come find him in the backside of the desert and he may come up with all of excuses and God pretty had much to just shove him into it. I mean, a lot, you see that over and over again. You know, Gideon's another great example of that. That's kind of the, you know, the, the, because it's not somebody who's just eager, who just wants the position. Who just wants the title. You know, it's somebody who actually wants to get in it for the right reasons. They want to be nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. Why? So that they can nourish others and bring them up in good doctrine as well. But he says there in verse 7, Refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So it's kind of in the context there of everything else. You know, he's kind of, it's the doctrine of devils and he kind of worried, it's just interesting, he kind of says, but you know, refuse profane wives' fables. You know, what, is, what does that mean? You know, well, there, we've all heard the wives' fables. You know, the, the, what's one that we hear a lot? Um, and not all wives' fables are profane. He's saying, you know, avoid the profane ones. I guess there's some, some are worse than others. We all we all know what wives' fables are. We've heard that, you know, like uh, like uh, oh, the, the, a woman will be pregnant, another woman will say, "Well, the baby's high or low. You're having a boy or a girl." Oh, I got heartburn. I'm having a boy. These are wives' fables, people. I, I know it's something. Like, they're like, "Oh no, I can tell. I'm, I've got 100% accuracy on, on predicting." Well, you got a 50/50 chance. <laughs> I mean, your odds are pretty good, first of all, right? And I always like to tell people, you know, well, I can tell you if you're having, you know, whether or not you're. I can tell you whether you're having a boy or a girl. And I'm, I have 100%. And so really, I'm saying, yeah, you're having a boy or a girl. You know, that's, that's the truth. <laughs> I'm right about that. So at least I better be. <laughs> Something else comes out. You got, you got troubles. <laughs> but, you know, we should, what, what does it mean here in the context of the scripture? You know, we shouldn't believe every stupid thing we hear. You know, we shouldn't, we should, every, every dumb thing that we hear, you know, we should test these things out. 
And people today are very gullible. And people today are very quick to, ju to just you know, follow after some new exciting thing. You know, they don't want to be put in remembrance. They want to hear some new thing. You know, they want to hear some new tantalizing conspiracy theory. They want to hear some strange new doctrine that nobody else has come up with. You know, and, they're, and he's telling, you know, refuse profane and old wives' fables and rather exercise, and re and exercise thyself rather into godliness. And, you know, if you're nourished up in the word, you won't be duped by these things. And that's kind of the context here. You know, be nourished up in the word of God and a good doctrine whereunto thou hast, thou hast attained. Put them in, in remembrance of these things. You know, a minister shouldn't get up and say, well, we're going to discuss the hollow earth tonight. You know, like some of these wackos that are out there that are pastoring churches. They want to get up and talk about the Nephilim. Or they want to explain to you the difference between the gray alien and the white alien. You know, it's out there. <coughs> and it's just a gimmick. It's just, you know, uh, you know just, just, just real... I don't, I don't, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just very showy. It's something that's very exotic. It's something that's just very extravagant to just try and wow people with and, and to get hits on YouTube. That's not what we're here to do as ministers. And that's not what you should want to hear as someone who comes to church. I mean, if you came to church tonight and I said, well, we're going we're gonna to get to the bottom of this Bigfoot thing once and for all. You know, we're going to, well, Bigfoot in light of the Bible tonight, folks. That's a profane old wise fable. It's just some stupid doctrine that has no bearing on our lives at all whatsoever. The, word, the house of God is, is where the word of God should be preached so that the saints, that the church of God can be edified, can be built up so that we can accomplish the work that God has been given to us. Not to go out and just teach dumb doctrine, you know, and just try, try to have these clickbait sermons that, so we can get views on, on YouTube. <coughs> and here's the thing. If, you know, if you're nourished up in the word of God, you're not going to get duped by these stupid, profane, old wives fables, these dumb doctrines. Which tells us this, that people should be reading their Bibles rather than spending countless hours on YouTube. You know, if we, if we spent as much time on YouTube as we did in the Word of God, we'd probably know the Word of God a lot better. Right. I mean, what if, if I could go back and get all the hours that I wasted just watching nonsense that hasn't profited me at all and t exchange that time for Bible reading, how much f further along would I be in my knowledge and growth? How much more nourished up in, the, in, in, in faith and good doctrine would I be? Tenfold. You know, and that's really what we need to be doing here. And that, and that is the purpose of ministers, to, to nourish others, to bring them up. And that's the purpose of ministers, to exercise us unto godliness. Right? Perf refuse profane and wives' fables, but exercise thyself unto godliness. Work at it. You know, have a regiment of godliness in your life. Exercise yourself in it. Have a plan. You know, people who are serious about getting in shape, you know, they have to have a plan. They can't just, you know, try this one day and try that the other and eat whatever they want. They have to sit down and say, well, this is my goal. This is where I want to get. Here's what I'm going to eat. Here's the exercise that I'm going to do. And then they have to do it. And that's what we have to do. We have to exercise unto godliness. That's the point of a good minister. That's what he is supposed to do to help us all exercise ourselves in the faith. And, you know, that's what Ephesians 4 tells us. I mean, we read this just the other night. He gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for what? So that they can glorify themselves? So they can get some online following? Now, if a pastor gets an online following because he's preaching sound doctrine, praise God. But if his whole purpose is just he's going to preach whatever to get an online following, then he's got the wrong motive. For, because the motive is the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. That's what we're here to do. That's why we exercise ourselves in godliness. So, you know, spiritual growth should be a priority in our life. That spiritual exercise. Look there in verse 8. In verse 8. <clears throat> For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the pri promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, verse 8 is not, let me say what it isn't, okay? It is not an excuse to dismiss bodily exercise, right? Now, I've got to be careful here, right? Because... It, some people look at that and say, well, see, you shouldn't exercise. You shouldn't even care about, you know, your physical, you know, what, what shape you're in. You know, it, we, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. It does, it says it profits. It's just a little. In comparison to godliness, right? 
It's not saying exercise is without profit in vain. Don't bother doing it. That's not what it says. And, and we have to be careful that, that, um, that we don't forget that, that we don't allow ourselves just to become, you know, so out of shape that, we're, that we can't even do the things of God. You know, people let themselves get to that point in their life. You know, they can't go soul winning up the flight of stairs because it wins them. You know, and sometimes, and, and some of you have gone with me, and we go up those three flights, and you got you know, the door is right there at the apartment complex. It's three flights of stairs, three stories, and it's time to knock on the door, and they come to the door, and you're like, my name's Corbin. I'm from a Baptist church. Can I give you an invite? You know, and they're looking at you like, it doesn't help that it's a hundred and whatever out, you know? And I remember that happened to me, you know, a while back. And I said, man, I got I to gotta hit the gym and, and get some cardio in. Now, now, I'm not saying that you, you know, here's the thing. People take this to an extreme, this bodily exercise. Boy, do we live in a culture that takes that to extreme. They, it says it profits a little, but they want to squeeze every bit of profit they can out of it. And their whole lives become bodily exercise. Right? That, that, that's the culture that we're in, this body image culture. We don't want to go to that extreme either. You know, we should keep ourselves in a good enough shape to where we can do the things that we need to do for God. You know, we shouldn't become obsessed with the way we look. You know, if, you're, if your goal in life is to, you know, try to look like, you know, the guy modeling on the Hanes underwear, you know, that you are probably got the wrong priority in life. You know, oh, I've got to get down to, you know, 4.5% body fat and, 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 you know, and no. You know, that's, you're going to be living in the gym. You know, and guys start getting into taking steroids and testosterone, uh, testosterone replacement th uh, and all these other things that go along with that. You know, that's the wrong focus in life. But uh, let's not go to the other extreme and say, well, let's just completely dismiss it. You know, you're, if getting up to that flight of stairs and knocking on that door is getting to be a little much for you, let's go, let's go get on the row machine twice a week and do 30 minutes of cardio. Maybe not cut back a little bit on the sugar. Whatever it is we got to do, lift some weights. And, it, you know, and there we go. You know, but I don't have to, uh, you know, try to make my, you know, start some modeling career or something like that. You know, that, that's, not, that's not what we want to do either. So <laughs> both profit here, right? The bodily exercise has profit, but it's just little, especially compared to what? To the godliness. It says that godliness will profit unto all things. Having the promise of the life that now is, godliness is going to profit you in this life and that which is to come. Bodily exercise isn't going to do that. It'll help you to some degree in this life, but in the world to come, it's not going to matter. Because we'll all have a glorified body. No one's going to care about your six pack. You know? No one's, we're all going to have that terrestrial body, we're gonna, or celestial, we'll put off the terrest terrestrial. We'll have the new body in Christ. We'll be as He is. And it's going to be way better than anything you can get here down at LA Fitness. You know, it, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be healthy. It's going to be fit. It's going to be uh, without disease and sickness. It's going to be great. But you know, you're not going to get that here. The, pro the, the bodily exercise here, it's not going to profit you in the next life. But the uh, godliness will. Now, godliness will profit you in the next life, but it's also going to profit you here, because godliness profit will profit all things. And here's the thing, godliness will even profit you physically. When you think about it, godliness, you know, living a life that's conforming to the desires of God. Living a life that is in accordance with God's commands. That's godliness, right? Being God-like, you know, living a righteous, clean, and holy life. That's going to profit you even your health in this life. Because think about it. If you're living a godly, clean life, you're not going to be in the bar. You know, at least you shouldn't be. Right? You're not going to be, you know, a glutton. At least you shouldn't be. You know, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna take care of the temple of God, your body. And you're going to live a holy, clean, sober life. That's going to extend your days. You know, if you get rid of the cigarettes, you're probably not going to get lung cancer. You know, you stop the chewing, no one's going to have to cut your, low, your jaw off. That happens. I've known guys like that. You know, you, you know, give up the drugs and the alcohol and everything. You're not going to suffer the consequences that come physically from, from being involved in those things. So it's going to affect you in that in the life, in your health. It's going to affect your, it's going to profit you in your family. It's going to profit you in your job. You know, if you do all things unto the Lord, you know, not, you know, not, with, uh, uh, not, with, not as men pleasers, with eye service, then you're going to be profitable in the job. You're going to get noticed probably without even trying. You're going to be the guy that gets the promotion. You're going to be the guy that, when everybody else, you, maybe you're not going to get the promotion, but when things get tight and everybody else, and they're starting to let people go, 
you're the last one on the chopping block. Why? Because you're doing things godly. You're, you're, li you're working as you are, you're, you know, unto the Lord, as, you're, as the Bible commands us to. You know, you're, you're, you're doing everything heartily. Whatever, whatsoever the hand findeth to do with it, do with all thy might, is what you're doing. You're going to your job day in and day out, and you're working hard. You're being godly at your job. It's going to profit you. It's going to profit you in, with your friends. It's going to profit you in all things, the Bible says. No area of your life will not be profited by you living godly in Christ Jesus. Not, there is not an area of your life that won't profit. Bodily exercise will profit you in one area, your health. That's it. And godliness will profit you in every area of this life and in the world to come. I mean, you're going to have the rewards in heaven, the mansion in heaven, the, 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 the praise of, every man shall have praise of God. He'll have the reward that God is bringing with him. I mean, if the prophet is, you know, it doesn't even compare. Now you could see why, you know, the bodily exercise profiteth little in comparison to the, the, the profit that godliness brings. <coughs> now let's, let's move along here in the chapter. We've still got quite a bit to go, but let's go ahead and jump into uh, uh, verse 11. He says, these things command and teach. I love that he says command. Don't just say, you know, this is what the Bible says, and it's probably a good idea if you do it. You say, command it. Say, thus say it, the Lord. And that's the kind of preaching that we need. People are just going to get up and say, this is what the Bible says. You can like it or lump it. Amen. You can take it or leave it. That's what it says. And he says, command it. You know, we should be commanding things that the Bible says. We should also be teaching them. You know, and that's a good principle, I think, even in parenting. You know, we, the, the, the phrase I always heard was that rules without reason breed rebellion. I think that's a good saying. Rules without reason breed rebellion. You know, we should command our children, but we should also teach them why we command these things. You know, we have these rules for a reason. We don't just make up rules to make your life miserable or try to be a downer. You know, there's a reason behind your, the rules. It's the same way in the house of God. It's the same way with the word of God. He has rules. He has commands because there's a reason behind it. And a lot of times it's for our own good to protect us from the evil. So he says, these things command and teach. It's a good principle that we can apply in life. Not to just command things, but to also teach them. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Now he says, let no man despise thy youth. You know, this is, this is something that, you know, that reminds me of the, remember our, our lady friend out there that you're always, you're always ragging uh, on me about? The, uh, how long you've been serving the Lord, lady? You know what I'm talking about? The lady who put the deacon in, her place, in his place, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're out we're out with some of the brethren knocking on the door and we knock on this door and she's I'm trying to give her the gospel well how long you been serving the Lord I'm like I told her and she looks at the next she looks at uh, brother uh, brother Andrew and he says well how about you and then he over to brother Adam well how about you she's like well I've been serving the Lord for like what was it she said 40 years she did the noodle neck thing <laughs> like that and she even stopped for like dramatic pause like to let that sink in wow 40 years she wasn't even saved you know, like we're supposed to be impressed with that or something. And uh, like she, what was she doing? She was despising the youth, right? Well, she's older. Now, we should give respect unto her elders, you know. We should respect the hoary head if it be found in the way of righteousness. Amen. You know, just being old doesn't automatically grant you the respect you think you deserve. It's if you're found in the way of righteousness. Now, we shouldn't go out of our way to disrespect old people if we, if we find out, you know, well, he, he's ungodly, so now it's okay for me to just treat him however, right? But it should be absolutely 100% expected of, of the, that we respect the hoary head if he's found in the way of righteousness. Uh, ten times more. We should, we should respect that. But we should also, you know, not despise the youth. And, you know, as I've heard, uh, you know, Pastor Anderson put it, when somebody would call, call, make comments like that at the door out soul winning, like, like, how old are you? You know, the, to the young people in the room might run into that. You know, the teenagers and things, and they're out trying to preach the gospel. And some middle-aged man comes to the door, or, you know, or someone who's well on in years. And now, now they have this, this you know, this, this whippersnapper, you know, this, this young pup is going to take the Bible and tell them what it says. Out of, out, of, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, right? I mean, uh, thou hast perfected praise. You know, God, God uses the, the, the foolish things and the base things of the world to confound the wise. You know, so that, there, that's, there's nothing wrong with that for, for a child to instruct an elder, somebody who's older, about the way of salvation, right? 
But here's the, temp here's the thing that might happen, is that person they're trying to say, well, how old are you? You know? And here's the thing. The book is older than everybody. And if you're just trying to show them what this says, then you know what? They have to, they have to acknowledge that. This is the authority. We're just the mouthpiece. So don't let anyone despise your youth. You know, and put you down. And this is something that we've seen, you know, our own pastor have to deal with, you know, in his ministry, you know, as a preacher. A lot of these older preachers will say, well, he's just, you know, he's just this young guy. I mean, the man's, you know, my age, you know, which, which is young, by the way, <laughs> you know, 38. And, uh, you know, he's raised several children, pastored a church for how, you know, over a decade. It's like, how long is he going to remain this, you know, they keep getting older, so we're, all, we're never going to catch up. That's kind of how it works. You know, every year I think I'm going to get them, but they're always a year ahead of me or whatever, you know. We'll always be the younger guy until we're into our 60s or something like that. But you know what? That's just them despising the youth. And that's on them. And he says, let no man despise thy youth. Now, how, how, do, you, how do you not let them do that? But be thou an example. You know, let them say whatever they want to say, but at, if they, when they examine your life and the way you live, you're an example, Right? They shouldn't be able to have any evil thing to say on their part. He says, but be thou an example. Uh, and I love the way he phrases this here. And I think this is important. This one little word. Be thou an example of the believers. Of the believers. He didn't say be an example to the believers. He said be an example of the believers. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Because here's the thing. Ministers of Christ... They are believers, right? At least they better be. <laughs> they themselves are believers. You know, I'm every bit in, uh, uh, I'm a, you know, a minister, but I'm also every, I'm a minister, but I'm also every bit a child of God as you are. You know, there's nothing special about me. Uh, it, we're, we're, all, we're all serving the same God. Yeah. We're all born again believers. Yeah. And, and the reason why the ministers and those that are, uh, you know, in the public position of preaching and, and leading have to meet these qualifications is so that they can serve as an example of the believers. That this is how a believer should live. This is how a believer should conduct themselves. This is how a believer should behave themselves. Right? Not, this is how I behave myself, you do whatever you want. No, it's, this is how I do it because that's how you're supposed to do it. I'm supposed to be an example of the believers. Their lives, uh, you know, should reflect the kind of life that we should all be living. You know, we should be able to look to the men of God and say, well, yeah, that they're the men of God and they live that way because we're supposed to live like that. We're supposed to consider the end of their conversation or consider the, yeah, consider the end of their, con their conversation. We're supposed to follow their faith considering the end of their conversation. You know, looking at their lives and seeing how they, how they conduct themselves and, and we should be doing the same way. So we, have seen, we see, you know, what kind of a minister Timothy was, was told to be here, right? He was told him, to be an example in conversation, right, the, in, the, in the way he conducts himself and the things that he says, in charity, you know, in, his, in, his, in his, uh, his love, right, and it starts out in word, you know, in the things that he's saying, in his conversation, the way he conducts himself, his charity, in his spirit, you know, kind of like his attitude, the way you would uh, carry yourself in faith and in purity, right? We see what kind of a minister he's supposed to be and then he kind of goes on to explain here how such a minister is made. How do you become such a minister? He says in verse 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You know, you want to be this kind of minister? Well, here's a recipe on how to get there. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Give attendance to reading. Now, when you see a list, often it's given in, in, in order of priority, right? We should always pay attention to that. Even when you listen to people speak, they'll, they'll often tell you what things are important to them. If they list off something, usually the first thing they mention is what's most important. You know, and, you know what are you? Well, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a deacon. And the most important thing in my life is God. You know, after that, it's my wife. After that, it's my kids. After that, it's the church. That's the order of priority in my life. You know, that's why I put it in that order. You know, what things are important to you. So he says here, he gives a list. Give attendance to reading is the first one, right? So reading, you know, is something that is pri should be a major priority in our life. Let me say this. 
Your personal Bible reading is more important than any other spiritual edification you have. There is no other source in your life that will benefit you more spiritually than your own Bible reading. It is the most potent, powerful uh, source of spiritual edification that's out there. I don't care how many hours you listen to preaching. I don't care how often you're in church. I don't care how much soul winning you do. Bible reading will edify you more than anything. Your own personal Bible reading is what needs to be the priority in your life. Over anything else, over the exhortation, which comes next. And what's the exhortation? That's the preaching, right? You know, I hear people say all the time, and I've heard multiple people say this to me over the years. I've listened to all of Pastor Anderson's sermons. I listen to eight hours of sermons a day. I listen to X amount. I've listened to three hours of sermons a day. I listen to every day. Now, I'm all for listening to sermons, you know. I listen to Pastor Anderson's sermons on a weekly basis because I have to keep stay caught up on the ones I'm missing on Sunday. You know, and they edify me. And, 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 you know, and if I get a chance that somebody else says, hey, this was a really good sermon, I try to make a point of listening to it. And I have time on my drives and things like that. I don't always feel like listening to a book or something like that. I'll listen to preaching. And, and you know, there's certain people I like to listen to. But if, if you're doing more, you can't, I don't want to come across as saying, you know, you're listening to too much preaching. But you know what would probably be even better is if you balance that out with some Bible. You got the audio Bible and probably listen to, the, oh, maybe do a little bit more of that. Because, um, you know, when you're listening to preaching, you should be comparing. You should be, you know, searching the scriptures to see whether these things be so. Yeah. You know, the spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophets. You know, and if we're, if we're only listening to the preaching, you know, are we, are we really going to be getting the full the full picture and, and when we go through the whole Bible you know we're getting the whole picture so you know we need to give attendance to reading now for preachers so he's kind of applying this more to Timothy who was a preacher so this would apply I think in the context more to preachers is that people who preach they need to develop that ability to preach they need to get, give attendance to it you know they need to make sure that they're, 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 they're improving that area but also, we all need to be present to receive the preaching. I think that's another way that we could, we could apply that here as well. You know, we should make a point of being in church when we can get there. Now, I understand life comes up, you know, and, and, and people get sick and, and things come up and we can't make it. I'm not saying if you miss a service that, you know, <laughs> you're going to fall apart spiritually, you know, because you're probably, especially if you're doing your Bible reading, you know, you're probably going to be all right. But we should make it a priority in our lives to be present for the preaching of the Word of God. And not just, on, you know, not just online. You know, I know I stream it, but, you know, th that's for people that are many, many, you know, states away. All two of them that want to watch, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing, you know, like, if we can be in church when the church is going on, we should be there. We should give attendance to reading. We should be reading our Bibles. We should be present for the exhortation for the preaching of the Word of God. And then, of course, there at the end, he says, to doctrine. Now, doctrine is last here, but that doesn't make it the necessary the least. But here's the thing. Without reading and without exhortation, you won't have right doctrine. You won't know what to believe. You need to have the reading so you can understand the exhortation so that you can have the right doctrine. That's how important reading is. And, you know, I've heard people say that. Oh, I've listened to every sermon Pastor Aaron's ever preached. And they end up being such wicked people that they're kicked out of the church. I, you know, why? Well, I wonder how his reading was. I wonder, uh, you know, what, what he, th well, you know, maybe he was physically present at church, but wasn't really, you know, his heart wasn't there. <coughs> so here's the thing. You know, you have to know why you believe what you believe. And not just because, you know, the preacher said so. Well, I go to Faithful Word. That's what Faithful Word believes. But is that what you believe? Because you read it for yourself and said, yeah, I agree with them. I agree with what's being preached. <coughs> you know, this, uh, this is the study of what we have read and the confirming of what we have heard. That's what the, the doctrine comes from. The study of what we have read. You know, the, ex the, the, the reading and the, the, uh, the confirming of the exhortation. Studying it, understanding, reading, and saying, okay, I've got the, I've got the, the, the reading down. I'm giving attendance to the reading. Now I'm here for the exhortation. I'm confirming it with the word of God. Now I have doctrine. Now I know why I believe what I believe. He goes on in verse 14. We'll wrap it up here. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of presbytery. So again, that's an important doctrine that 
it's something, this position of being that Timothy has was given to him by the laying on of hands. It's not something he just took on himself. That's a whole other sermon in itself. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that I profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now when he says save thyself, he's not talking about salvation in the sense of going to heaven. Right? That's not what he's referring to. He's saying, say, you shall save thyself. Timothy's already saved. Once you're saved, you're always saved. We understand that. But he's saying you're not going to go off into false doctrine. You're not going to make your faith shipwreck. You're not going to destroy your life. You know, if you take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine, take heed unto how, you know, are we, are we uh, putting more emphasis on the godliness or on some physical, earthly, carnal thing? Or we're, we should be taking heed unto ourselves. What are our priorities in life? Are we, are, we, are we making the priority of reading and exhortation and doctrine a, a priority in our life? Are we taking heed unto ourselves and unto the doctrine? Are we continuing in them? You know, it's one thing to know it all and understand it all. It's, one thing, it's another thing to keep living in it. You know, it's, it, 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 like I said the other day, Christian life measured in decades, not years. You got to continue in these things. And if you continue in them, you're going to save yourself. You're going to save yourself a lot of heartache and despair and chastening if you continue in these things and them that hear thee the guy who continues in these things and is nourished up in the words of faith and sound doctrine is able to also save you know spare of the people that hear him he's able to get up and say hey this is what the bible says and help them to 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 save themselves from a life of heartache and things like that from judgment from condemnation from the chastening hand of god that's what he's saying to be saved from to not make yourself shipwreck not to make a mess out of your life. Not to, to end poorly, but to end well. And that's what we should all want for our lives. And that's why it's important that, that, we, that we have uh, you know, all of these things that are mentioned in this chapter, you know, uh, towards the latter end there, giving attendance to the reading, the exhortation to the doctrine. And, and if we do that, and if we meditate upon them and give heed, you know, uh, and give ourselves to them and take heed into ourselves you know, them and continue in them, we're going to spare ourselves a lot of heartache. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer.